As we come down to our final camp meeting style, or uh, let me say it this way, I don't know if it's a final camp meeting style service, but it's definitely our last uh, in the sermon series uh, from Elmer Callis, uh, Parables from the Backside. And this is a, uh, you know, have you ever chosen something, said you were going to do something, and said, dang, now i got to do it. <laughs> Wish you hadn't. Mm -hmm. That's this one. That's the one I'm going to share with you today. It is, it's a difficult, and, it, and I'll be honest, for me, through a lot of my life, it's been kind of a confusing parable of Jesus. It's one that I struggle with. So let's, uh, I invite you to take your Bibles if you brought them with you or, or open the app on your phone, whatever you have. And let's go to Luke chapter 13. And this, the sermon's going to be based on uh, verses 6 through 9, but I'm going to go a little bit further up. I'm going to start back at verse 1 because that's actually part of this parable. So Jesus is in the temple and he's teaching, okay? And all of a sudden, he gets this news. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some of the people from Galilee as they were offering a sacrifice at the temple. And then Jesus says, Do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Is this why they suffer? Not at all. You will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people that died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Were they worse sinners in Jerusalem? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No. And I tell you again, that unless you repent, you too will perish. These are God. Uh, then I move into the parable that we're going to share. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I have waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thank you, Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for your presence here among us today. We ask your direction in our lives, and especially, Lord, we pray that you will open our hearts to hear your word for us in this sermon. Challenge us, Lord, to be the people that you would have us be. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Now, Ellsworth Callis calls this particular parable the parable of Moses. Uh, he calls it the parable of Moses and the fig tree. Now, that's not what I call it. Because when I read this, I realized something about this particular parable that I had never really thought of before. This is truly the parable of second chances. This is truly a parable where someone has a chance, somebody has made a decision, somebody has, is, has decided that we're going to try one more time. So I think it speaks to where you and I are today, both as individuals and as a church. I think there's some things that we need to hear. You know, earlier in the chapter, I read you those first verses, the people were confused because these people had just gone to the temple to do what it was that you do at the temple. You worship God, right? So they had gone and they had made their sacrifices. And while they were there making their sacrifices, Pilate decided to have them killed. Why would he do that? Well, the historian, the great historian Josephus has paralleled so many things that happened at and during the time of Jesus. We have a better understanding of the cultures 
and, and the context of what was going on in that time. You see, who was the oppressor in Israel at that time? Who can you tell me? Rome. Rome, right? Now, one of the things that an oppressor wants to make certain that everybody understands is who is boss and who is not, right? Who is the oppressor and who is the oppressed? And I told you about the incredible amount of taxes that they made on everything. Like 60% of everything that they made went to Rome. Well, Pilate especially, during the season of Passover, that was a time when he truly liked to show who he was and show his strength and show his might. Because he never wanted the people, the, the Hebrew people, to forget that he was in charge, Rome was in charge, and they were not. And so Passover was one of the busiest times of the year, each and every year, because it was at Passover that people would make a pilgrimage. Now, it was, it is still to this day for the for uh, Jewish people, everybody wants to be in Jerusalem during Passover. As a matter of fact, whenever they have their, their Seder meal, they say next year in Jerusalem is one of the things that they say. So in this case, we know that a, a, a town, which I mean Jerusalem is one of the big cities, but it swelled to like three, four, five times its normal population. Because people would save up all their lives to have the opportunity to go to Jerusalem at least once. And if they could go more often, then that was even a greater blessing. But Rome knew that this was a time they needed to show their arm, they needed to show their might. And so here were these people, here were these pilgrims, who had come to do the thing that they had promised, the thing that they had always wanted to do. They came, their, their sacrifices were being offered, and then Pilate had them killed. And this is what I, I think when we see an injustice, we want everybody to jump on board, don't we? We do. I do. If I see something that I think isn't fair, I want to say to other people, aren't you outraged like I am? Aren't you angry like I am? How dare this happen? And that is exactly what, when they were telling Jesus, when, his, when, when the people were telling Jesus, Jesus, did you hear what happened? Aren't you angry too? And then Jesus says something that's really confusing and also very unexpected. Because y'all know what? That's exactly what Jesus did every single time. Was he went for the deeper truth. You know, how could God allow this to happen? These are his people. How dare God allow this to happen? You see, the Jews believed in the justice of God. They believed that if somebody was hurt, if somebody was killed, then it was about God's justice. And if it wasn't apparent, then there must be some kind of underlying sin that the person had committed, and therefore that's why they were dealing with the things that they were dealing with, because they were being punished for an evil that they had done. And then Jesus said something to them that just blew them out of the water. We probably didn't even hear it. The people who died were no worse nor no better than any of us. What? How could that be? If we understand how we understand God and we understand God, there was a justice. He said they were no worse than any of them. And then he war warned his listeners. He said, if you do not repent from your sins, you will all die just as they did. Now, aren't y'all happy y'all came for this sermon today? <laughs> this is a tough one. You know, Jesus, we, we have made Jesus so comfortable that we don't hear the depth of what he's sharing with us. We don't hear the radical message that he offers each one of us. So then he told
tells them a parable. It's a difficult parable. And he sounds like he's not even really concerned about the news that he's just heard. Yeah, I know. And that can happen to you too. But Jesus pushes us to understand more than what we see on the surface. And then he tells a story. A man had a fig tree in his garden. Anybody here like figs? I do. But I like enough to eat in a city. And some big trees can produce a bountiful harvest. And usually when a big tree is healthy, that's exactly what it does. It's shade, it's sustenance for the yellow jackets <laughs> and the wasps and the snakes and the birds. But it's also for us as well. But when a but when a fig tree really has a great harvest, it even comes in waves. Well, so this man had this planted this fig tree in his garden. He has gardener tending to it, and apparently from the outside, everything looked great. It looked like it should be just full of figs, and apparently it was not uncommon that in the first, the second, or the third year, that there should be some kind of fruit on this. And what normally happens is. Maybe the first harvest isn't as big as the next, but then this next year there'll be a little more, and the next year it should be in full-blown harvest. And when he goes, when the gardener goes and he's expecting, he's got his mouth set for, he wants one of those ripe figs, and he pushes back the leaves, and nothing. And he's more than a little angry because he has waited what he feels is very patiently for those figs to come in, to be the benefactor of those that harvest. There should be something there. And he was so angry, he said, just cut it down to the ground. Get rid of it. It is wasting my resources. It's wasting labor for the, the men who are taking care of it. It's taking fertilizer. It's taking water. Get rid of it. It's not productive. It's not good for anything. And then the gardener does something which is really unheard of. The gardener says, wait. Give it one more chance. Let me tend to it very specifically, very specially. Let me make, do everything possible so that next time when you come, next year there will be a great harvest on it. Give me one more chance. And the gardener agrees. And then he says, and if it has no crop, then we will destroy it. We will cut it down and throw it into the fire. You know, it's likely that this parable was referring to the people of Israel because they had let God down time and time and time again. They had failed to fulfill their callings. They had missed God's expectations, and they were drawing near to judgment. Their time was about done. But as I listen to that, I'm thinking, whoo, wait a minute. If I truly believe that Scripture speaks not only to the time in which it's written, but also speaks to me where I live and I stand and I breathe now, I'm going to have to think about this. Because this, to me, is a very convicting piece of scripture. God expects of all of us to be fruitful. God expects from his church to be fruitful. There is a very deliberately stated message here for us. And if we are not fruitful, we are in danger. And when we hear it, and we hear it that way, we only hear the judgment side of the parable. And this is where the grace comes in. We have 
the great gardener, Jesus Christ, who said, Lord, give them one more chance. Give them one more chance. Send me to bridge the chasm of brokenness so that these people can have a chance to make a difference. You know, the gardener was actually arguing with God. I'm sorry, the gardener was actually arguing with the owner of the vineyard, right? He said, you know, you got to give this another try. you got to give it another chance. But there are other places in Scripture where we have heard people arguing. They were arguing with God. Remember Moses? Lord, I know they're terrible. I know what they've done is bad, but give them another chance, Lord. I know they're down there, and they're partying like they shouldn't, Lord. Just, they are your people. Let's try again. Remember Abraham? When he was talking to the angels, he said, we're about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, well, if I can find 50 righteous people, will you still destroy it? Don't destroy it. And then he, he bargained all the way down to what? One, two. We, Scripture makes it sound like we can change God's mind. But in my life, I've been told it's not that I can change God's mind, but more so that my will and my heart can come alignment with God to see the world from God's perspective. And I think truly that is what this text is trying to tell us. We have a great gardener who has who is invested in our lives so much. He invested with his entire self, with his very life, to say, Lord, don't give up on them. Father, don't give up on them. I don't want to do this, but if this is what it takes, I'll do it so that these people can have a chance to know what it is to be in full and loving relationship with you. We live in a world of conflict. It seems like we are surrounded by darkness constantly, whether it's in our personal lives or it's in the world that we see out there and we see reported on the news and, and repeated time and time again. And it seems like everything out there is trying to destroy and defeat the powers of good and the love in the world. Much of what happens in the world is not God's will. It's not God's will. It's not God's will that children are starving. It's not God's will that we have a, our current plague is COVID. It's not God's will that our, our friends have gotten sick and we've lost people we love to that awful disease. It's not God's will that soldiers were killed in Afghanistan. It's not God's will. This is part of what it is to live in a broken world. A world that doesn't, that doesn't live within the love that it was designed, to, that it was created to work within. You know, today, every one of us prayed something. Remember the Lord's Prayer? When we pray for God's will to be accomplished, we're acknowledging that sometimes God's will is not done. Or that we just assume it was done, right? Thy will be done. But more than that, what we're saying when we pray those words is that we are committing to be a part of the labor force to make it happen, to change the world around us so that we can help it come to pass, that God's will will be done where we are in this time, in this place, in our lives, in this church. In a world that was created out of love, when it is operated with no love, out of selfishness, out of anger, out of deceit. It's easy to become discouraged. But here's the thing. We have the 
promise. We have the, we have the word that was sent to us. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, I believe that God knows the pain that we endure. He knows when we he, when we mess up. He knows the the brokenness and the and the and the grief that we bear. I know that. I believe that with all that I am. But I also know that because of God's great sacrifice for us, we if we believe, if we truly live out what we say we believe. That means that we are gardeners who are going to be invested in tending this world that was created out of love. And we are going to be grace and we are going to be peace and we are going to be forgiveness and we are going to be people who come and stand alongside people who are broken and hurting. We are going to be light and grace and salt in a world that desperately needs our presence. And it's going to be more than us gathering on a Sunday morning. We're going to live lives that are actively invested in the lives of others. And we will be the place where people say, I want to be a part of that church because things are happening there. I want to be part of a church where they are invested in their community. I want to be part of a church that loves families. I want to be a part of a church that comes alongside people who are broken and hurting. And they show the love of God. Together, brothers and sisters, we can transform the world. Not for ourselves, but in the name of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, you challenge us each and every day in your word to be the people you've called us to be. So on this day, this very day, Lord, let us recommit our lives and our hearts to, to be what it means to be. To call ourselves Christian. People who know what it means to live and to love and to share your love with others. 